Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. And today's a really special day for me. I can't really tell you why, but it's just a, just a very special day. When the Death Star arrived in the Yavin system all those years ago, threatening to destroy the Rebel contingent at Echo Base, did any of you guys think to yourself, why didn't they just pack up and leave? I mean, we're not sure exactly how long the Rebels had to evacuate the base, but shortly after the Rebels finished their mission briefing on the Death Star, we get this scene right here. The moon with the Rebel base will be in range in 30 minutes. I estimate that the Rebels had at least an hour warning, perhaps even more if the Rebel scanners at the base could detect the chronal radiation that's emitted by ships traveling in hyperspace. In the lead up to the Battle of Hoth, Admiral Kendall Ozzel made the mistake of jumping out of hyperspace right over the planet. Rebel sensor techs were able to detect the chronal radiation from Darth Vader's Death Squadron, which gave the entire base ample time to start evacuating personnel. The Rebels during that battle decided to escape despite being in a much stronger position than they were during the Battle of Yavin. First, they had a massive planetary shield, which bought them considerable amounts of time because even the Death Squadron's command ship, a Super Star Destroyer, didn't have enough power to overwhelm it. And so the Empire instead had to carry out a ground invasion that takes even more time and exposes their forces to enemy fire. The Rebels at Hoth also had collected a pretty robust arsenal of weapons like the ground-based V-150 Ion Cannon, which was able to completely disable a Star Destroyer in orbit. They also had large fighter complements available along with a sizable contingent of Rebel infantry. They could have held on for a pretty long time and that's actually what happens. The entire evacuation of Echo Base takes 11 hours. The Rebels even managed to pull off a very heroic delaying action against one of the finest Imperial ground commanders in the Imperial Army, General Maximilian Veers. So what gives? Why did the Rebels at Yavin 4 forget to do what the Rebels do best and that is run away from a fight that they can't win? I mean, Mon Mothma's greatest attribute as a leader of the Rebellion was that she balanced out more hot-headed factions and leaders within the Rebellion. It was thanks to her that the Rebellion would only really engage Imperial forces when seeking strategic level goals. They weren't just going around like Saw Gerrera and blowing up every Imperial depot they can get their hands on. And the military leaders that Mon Mothma would gather together like Jan Dodonna, Antok Merrick, and Gravin Dreis established the Rebel Alliance's cautious naval doctrine, which focused on creating a lean, mean, mobile force that was self-sustainable even when operating in deep space. And so their starfighters from the Y-Wings to the B-Wings were all equipped with state-of-the-art hyperdrives. They didn't even need a carrier ship to carry them around. So let's take a closer look at the background information surrounding the Battle of Yavin 4. And to really understand this battle, we actually have to go backwards a little bit to the Battle of Scarif. We talked about Mon Mothma being the voice of reason and limiting the amount of exposure that the rebel forces had to the Empire. Well, that all changed when a young rebel by the name of Jyn Erso led an unsanctioned mission to retrieve the plans for a super weapon from the Imperial Archives on Scarif. At first, the various factions that made up the Alliance to Restore the Republic were unwilling to commit to what would have been an assault on a heavily guarded Imperial world that had a robust planetary shield. In truth, the Alliance to Restore the Republic had yet to fight together as a combined army. They were all just various little factions with their own military forces, and so deciding how to use this combined army was very difficult. But then Jyn Erso and Cassian Andor and a handful of Rebel Marines and Pathfinders would steal a transport like the criminals they were and launch a suicide mission to Scarif anyway. This would in turn inspire the others, especially those who already supported the plan. Intercepted Imperial transmission, Mom. Rebels on Scarif. I need to speak with Admiral Radis. He's returned to his ship. He's going to fight. Admiral Radis and the Mon Cala controlled many naval assets and formed the backbone of the rebel fleets. With them engaged, it was now clear that a fight was about to occur. And with sufficient support for the assault, Mon Motha was now comfortable with sending the entire fleet. Mon Motha was a rebel, but she was also an idealist, a political leader who loved democracy and had egalitarian values. She would have never ordered her forces to attack if their hearts weren't into it. And so even though she personally believed in Jyn Erso's message and wanted to launch an attack on the Death Star, she didn't make the decision on behalf of everyone else. It's a chaotic way to run a military force, but when everyone is a volunteer, has diverging interests, and are poorly equipped and poorly trained, all it really takes is one big loss to completely dismantle this organization, and Mon Motha was desperate to not let that happen. It was important for her that the fighters who partook in this mission understood what was at stake and were cool about the sacrifices they were about to make. 
The Battle of Scarif would become a tactical win for the Empire, but a strategic victory for the Rebellion. Both sides had been heavily bloodied during the battle, and the appearance of the Death Star just made things even deadlier for both sides. But the plans for the Death Star were stolen and secured, which was really the only thing that mattered. It was one big miracle for the Rebels to be able to extract this information and that information would lead to another bigger miracle at Yavin 4. Once it was clear that the Death Star had pursued the Millennium Falcon to the Yavin system, General Jan Dodonna came up with a contingency plan for the Rebellion in case things went sour. He decides to send Mon Mothma as far away from Yavin 4 as possible. Although Mon Mothma often liked to deny this, she was really the heart and soul of the Rebellion. It was her wisdom and her compassion that really shaped the Rebellion into what it would become. So Mon Mothma would be placed on a shuttle with a treasure trove's worth of information on Rebels' uh, safe houses and where assets were located and everything else you would need to restart the rebellion if it you know, got to that. As much as Mon Mothma tried to protest and also pull rank on General Dodonna, there's no arguing that her skills were not going to be very useful for the coming battle. She understood what was at stake and she agreed to go away the future of the Rebellion would lie in her hands, or so she thought. Now during this time, Mon Mothma had a period of weakness, not all different from the shock she experienced when she realized that Luthen Ariel had carried out a brazen robbery against the Empire. The time has come to force their hand. People will suffer. That's the plan. Now Mon Mothma would run through the scenarios in her head of what would happen if Yavin 4 was destroyed. She could rally the remaining forces in the Rim and start a true galaxy-wide rebellion. Perhaps she could even convince other Imperial Senators to join her cause. But Mon Mothma knows that this war will be difficult and that the Death Star will destroy so many worlds and so many lives. Mon Mothma knows that her tolerance for death and destruction can only go so far. She knows that at one point the Rebels themselves will suffer so much, become so desperate, well, they will be monsters, not so different from the Emperor. That is the problem with fighting evil. It has ways of getting beneath your skin, teaching you its vile ways, and turning you into something unrecognizable. And so, Mon Martha came up with a plan of her own. If Yavin 4 was destroyed, she wouldn't try to restart the rebellion. She would head straight to Coruscant and give herself up to Emperor Palpatine and end the war. Mon Martha had almost given up. But here's the thing. The Rebels were pumped up from their most recent victories. They had seen what the victory at Scarif did for their morale and their image all across the galaxy. Another large victory could drive much needed recruits to the movement and also much needed donations to the movement. Especially considering that news about the destruction of Alderaan was beginning to spread across the galaxy. Apparently it wasn't a mining accident and a deliberate attack by Palpatine. In our last video, we talked about how important Alderaan is to the Republic and its culture. Wilhelm Tarkin's destruction of the planet was not only unnecessary, but potentially could create some serious backlash against the Empire. The rally was the Rebellion could never really win a outright conventional war against the Empire. They had tens of thousands of ships and controlled all of the major resources and industrial capacity in the galaxy. The only way to defeat the Empire was to take from them, inspire the average person to rise up and leave the Empire and join the Rebellion, or better yet, encourage young pilots like Wedge and Tilly's to leave the Imperial Navy and join the Rebellion. I don't wanna say hearts and minds, but yeah, that was Mon Mothma's strategy, and I think in this case, it was the right strategy. And prior to this point, the Empire had never presented a target like the Death Star. Even the Super Star Destroyers paled in size and strategic importance. By taking so many resources and putting it into this one space station, the Empire had created a massive target for the Rebellion to hit. The members of Rogue One, who had sacrificed their lives, understood the danger of this weapon. And the Rebels who took part in the Battle of Yavin 4 all had lost friends at Scarif or had you know, partook in that battle directly. Gravin Drys lost his pal Antog Merrick. Together they had formed the Rebel Starfighter Corps. They were the ones who chose the X-Wing as the Rebel workhorse. They even flown together in a planetary defense force before the rise of the Empire. All the squadrons, red, gold, and green, that took part in the attack on the Death Star had just recently lost pilots, wingmen, and friends at Scarif. Rarely in life do you ever get the immediate opportunity to you know, get a little revenge for your buddies. Passions were running high and hot, and even though some pilots were bewildered by the size of the enemy they faced. Pardon me for asking, sir, but what good are snub fighters going to be against that? Hope and the memory of the Rogue One team was still fresh in the minds of these crazy men who had partaken in the attack. Well, the Empire doesn't consider a small one-man fighter to be any threat. 
An analysis of the plans provided by Princess Leia has demonstrated a weakness in the battle station. That weakness was the lack of point defense weapons. The smallest guns that could be found on the surface of the Death Star was a freaking turbo laser, which was designed to take out capital ships. And Dodano was right. The Empire would be arrogant. They wouldn't deploy TIE fighters until the Rebels had entered the gravitational field of the space station. There was also one last factor that most likely helped Jan Dodano make the decision to take a stand and fight for Yavin 4, and that was a logistics problem. Logistics are oftentimes overlooked, but they are probably the most important part of how any battle unfolds. And the Rebels had far too many supplies and personnel at that base and just not enough transport ships to get everyone away. Much of the Rebel fleet had been sent to Scarif and were subsequently destroyed there. The squadrons who made it back and were stationed on Yavin 4 were still in recovery mode and not at full strength. There was really no place for the Rebels to run, and that is what made them exceptionally dangerous. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.